Rajalakshmi Srinivasan. An IS officer of the Gujarat Garda, Jayanti Ji has been balancing her very demanding official commitments with concerts at prestigious venues across the world. She has been creating unique presentations, bringing together elements and styles of music, dance, and narrative. This evening, she will be accompanied by her daughter, Kripa Ravi, a talented young Bharatanatyam dancer of the Kalakshetra style. She has learned with the senior exponent, Padma Shri Anand Shankar Jain. Kripa has traveled extensively and performed in India and abroad, and is the recipient of the prestigious Guru Muthusam Kalai Award by the Krishnagana Sabha, amongst many other accolades. Accompanying the mother-daughter duo, we have very eminent musicians who have come down especially for this concert from Chennai. On the Pradhangam, we have Vidwan Shri Kandanji. Please put your hands together. On the violin, Shri Kalai Arasanji. And on the front, we have young Sartha Karore, who is currently residing in Oroville and is volunteering. A very warm welcome to all of you and thank you to the two Vidwans who have come specially to make this program special for us. Friends, Suresh has already mentioned, kindly do switch off your mobile phones or at least keep them in the silent mode. We deeply appreciate your cooperation. As you all know, this is a 60-minute performance and there will be no break during the entire duration of the concert. Before I leave you, I'd like to share a wonderful quote. It is said that once Sage Narad asked the Lord, O oh Krishna, tell me, where do you truly reside? And the Lord replied, Naham Vasami Vai Kunte, Yogi Nam Hridaye Naja, Mad Bhakta Yatra Gayanti, Tatra Dishthami Narada. O oh Narad, neither do I dwell in Vai Kunta, nor in the hearts of the yogis, but I dwell in delight where my devotees sing my name in the fervor of bhakti. On that note, I leave you to revel in the experience of Sri Krishna Dasapanchangana. Thank you. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
for the day. We today present a new genre called Tatha Vritya Gitam, a melange of stories, dance, and music. And in a sense of true devotion, offer this at the lotus feet of the mother and of the lotus feet of all of you who are sadhaks on the path of what the mother had ordained and the philosophy of Sri Aurobindo. Sri Krishna has a unique place in the life of Sri Aurobindo when he was jailed at the Alipur prison. He writes, I had an experience of Sri Krishna Kali. It was a very powerful vision, he says. And this experience completely changed the course of his life and probably led him to do so much more, contribute so much to humanity. And we are all indeed a part of something that was triggered by that powerful experience connected with Sri Krishna in the life of Sri Aurobindo. Sri Krishna also represents the complete expression manifestation of the divine that we often refer to as the Purna Avatar. And it also represents the divine spark in the lotus seated within each one of us. Sri Krishna is symbolic of that. And when we have the highest aspiration to seek the divine, it is that spark that we are constantly invoking. This evening, we will soak ourselves in various songs, stories, and music depicting the life of Sri Krishna. He was divinity and bliss incarnate. He was a universal law of goodwill, law, law of harmony, law of love. And we attempt to depict five stages of the life of Sri Krishna. Bal Krishna, Krishna as a little charming baby who could steal anyone's heart. Lal Krishna, the young Krishna, who's full of pranks and yet, indeed, the undisputed lord of love. Gopal Krishna, the cowherd, the young cowherd, who's also with a lot of full of mischief and pranks. Dwarka Bij, the king of Dwarka, who was also a king maker. And finally, Yogeshwara Krishna, who was himself a coach, a mentor, we could even call him a master strategist, who really led the Pandavas to victory in the Mahabharata. So, these five hues of the divine blend together into the essence of the ambrosia nectar of Sri Krishna, Sri Krishna was a Panchamita. Yeah. 
Infinity, Perfect, and Free Point in space and time. And manifests sometimes at the most improbable places. Nearly 5,000 years ago, it was almost this time of the year, the monsoon season. It was a really dark, terrible, dungeon-like prison in the city of Mathura, where Devaki and Vasudev were imprisoned. They were about to give birth to their eighth baby. The cruel and wicked king Kamsa, who had a prophecy that he would be killed by the child born to Devaki had imprisoned them. And this time, whenever there's a devout person beseeching the divine from the bottom of their heart, the divine does manifest and come to their rescue. So as they were given, so they've prayed to the Lord, they gave birth to a beautiful, beautiful baby, which was as dark as the clouds, Krishna. Suddenly, there was a magical spell all across the prison. This prison which used to be under tight vigil and guarded day and night by guards who would be on the crown suddenly everything as if seemed to go into a deep slumber. Vasudev, as was pre-planned, places the baby on a basket, carries the basket on his head and he magically finds that the shackles that hold him together suddenly give way. He tiptoes to the gates of the prison only to find the guards snoring away. The gates gradually open up quietly. It's pouring torrentially. He tiptoes to the banks of the Yamuna, the river Yamuna Ji too. And who would not be absolutely, she's eager, perhaps a little greedy, to touch the feet of this divine which has taken the form of the baby. So she swells the rivers in spade and the waters touch the tiny feet of the Lord. And yet she magically creates way for Vasudeva to walk across the river without any hassle. He re reaches the other end of the river and walks across to Gokul into the household of Yashoda and Nanda. They were expecting a baby and the spell the babies had exchanged. And then the couple realizes that they've given birth to this beautiful baby boy who's black in color and charming. The entire household, the entire Gopal, the community, they're all delighted. Maybe some sweets, 
but the sadhu is adamant. There's no way. I'll stay back and look at the baby, he insists. Don't you know that even the mighty Shiva had to listen to Parvati ji and abide by what she said? There's no way you'll see the baby. And she walks right back into the house. And she sees the baby crying uncontrollably. She tries everything possible to pacify the baby, to calm him. But she's just not able to. And finally, she relents. She takes the baby, calls the sadhu, here, you may have a look at him. The eyes of the sadhu meet the eyes of the baby. The baby stops crying. He has a little smile on his face. And now the sadhu gets a little bold, brazen. I want to hold the baby, he says. Yashoda is absolutely infuriated. She's annoyed. How dare you? You wanted to see the baby and now you want to hold him? There's no way. And she moves back to the baby. And again, the baby is now kicking his hands and legs and screaming uncontrollably. Absolutely after trying everything, she's at her wit's end and finally decides to let the sadhu touch the baby. He holds the baby. As he does that, it's as if the two eyes are locked in a divine embrace. It's as if two long lost friends have met. The baby is now squealing in delight. He's gently kicking his hands and legs and looking into the eyes of this mendicant. Mm-hmm.